science when it's time to begin. It's on the rewind to rhyme with John Pollock and waiting. The A team that makes sense of these things we see in the ring every week on TV. It's rewind to rhyme for Monday night, then load a Tuesday morning from the post wrestling site. It's rewind to rhyme for Monday night on USA now on the John and Wade take the mic. Hello, everybody. It is John Pollock and Wei Ting here with you on Monday night, December the 4th. Hello, Wei. Hey, John. How you doing? I'm doing swell. I'm doing great. Doing good. Great. Good. Fantastic. Staying warm? Um, I am. Yes. Staying healthy? Healthy. Happy. Fixing stuff around my house. Um, Not too much to complain about. Okay, good. Good. So I'm uh, glad to hear it, uh, I guess, in comparison to, to some previous weeks here. We're on an upswing, dare I say. Well, happy to hear it. About to uh, undergo basement renovations. That's going to be fun. Oh, an excuse to completely redo your basement. Yeah, yeah, by ourselves. So that, that should be fun. Oh, maybe that be maybe great. that should be some TikTok content. Please. Sure. Okay. I'll, I'll keep everyone at the edge of their seat. Do you have a quiet week coming up? Yeah, I do. Very. Hope. Where are you? Where, where are you going to be? Can, can you let us in? Where are you going to be in twenty four hours? Hopefully, I'm, I'm going to be in the Dominican Republic. The Dominican Republic. Mm-hmm. Now wait a minute. If if my math is correct, you are married and you have a child. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this is going to be the first airplane ride for young Oscar. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, and, I think he'll be a. I think he'll be a breeze on this. I think it's going to be. Oh, we'll see. I mean, have you done it? Not on an airplane, no. You never took a, a little child on on a plane, no. Mm. no. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's gonna be an adventure, you know. Um, we uh, like just the idea of having to bring everything that we need on a daily basis with us into a suitcase is incredibly daunting. Um, but you know, we'll we'll we'll, we'll make it. This has to be a departure. You are an exceptionally light packer. I have noticed. Uh, I I can be I can be, but um, my partner is not, and uh, a baby certainly is not. So we have to bring pretty much everything, and uh, it's it's going to be. I mean, I'm sure it'll be fun. You know, I'm sure it'll be relaxing to an extent. But we also don't have like a lot of the things we rely on to keep him guarded. So we're gonna kind of be half relaxed, but also like half on much higher alert than usual because he's walking now and you know um, everything could be dangerous so um it'll be fun i'm sure either way i think you're gonna have a great time i think it's gonna be a it's it's natural to always uh worry about the unknown but i think you'll have a i think you'll have a fantastic time well thank you i hope so have some drinks with oscar you know what i mean um yeah sure yeah oh he's gonna go crazy i'm sure it could be it could be wild you know a future uh a future Braden Harrington you might be raising. Wow. I can only uh, hope. Yes. Yes. Well, we have lots to get to on tonight's show. We will be getting to Raw, but I just checked the calendar. It's not November anymore. It's December at the Post Wrestling Cafe, and we have uh, put out our schedule for this coming month. So uh, do give us some time here to look at some of the, uh, the highlights this month. We are going to have two editions of Rewind Away dropping over this final month of the year. Beginning with December 14th, we're going to be looking at season one of The Ultimate Fighter. We are going to be reviewing several episodes, not the entire season, episode by episode, but enough that you will get the full flavor of a tough season one all the way back in 2005. Mm-hmm. Way our, back. Yes. our uh, when, when Ultimate Fighter debuted in January of 2005, was a four-year-old Julia Hart turning on Spike TV after Raw? I'm going to say probably not. I'm guessing she was not either. Uh, But maybe when she was a few years older, she was ordering WWE Backlash 2007 from April of 2007, headlined by a fatal four-way match involving John Cena, Shawn Michaels, Randy Orton, and Edge. Mm -hmm. You way couldn't... He was just chatting my ear off about backlash 2007 the other day. I'm, I'm positive i watched this probably with you guys and um i don't remember any second of it 
whatsoever. My memory of this show is the main event is really, really good. And don't okay. ask me anything else about the show. But that's why we have these reviews to go back and remember. Oh, yeah. Clash 2007 was mm -hmm. a show that did, in fact, happen. So that is all going to be happening this month, along with uh, the New Japan World Tag League Final. It wraps up this Sunday. Karen Peterson and Bruce Lord have you covered uh, this coming weekend. And throughout the month, we will have a new Ask Away going through one final mailbag for the year. So find out if you're on the naughty or nice list uh, this year, depending on your question and how uh, important it is. Plus, weekly reviews of SmackDown and Collision, all available at postwrestlingcafe.com. Those on the Double Double and Espresso tiers at the cafe uh, will also be getting multiple audio news updates where I am in a room all by myself, this very room, and I talk to myself and I read, and you get to hear my voices. Here, when you're reading my updates, you're always probably wondering, man, I wonder I wonder how he would pronounce that name. I wonder what tone he would inflect on this particular sentence. Well, folks, there's only one way to find out, and that is by checking out John Pollock's audio news updates. He hears voices in his head, everybody. And, they talk uh, to me. That yeah. is it. Uh, so there you go. Postwrestlingcafe.com. Uh, $6 gets you in the door, and that gives you access to all of the, uh, the bonus audio content that you can see up here including all 144 editions of rewind away perfect for a flight to the dominican republic start off in 2017 and by mid 2018 you'll just be in love with us and you, you'll want to cancel your trip like you know what i'm just going to stay here at the airport and just listen through my whole vacation uh you could do that sure yeah also ad free versions of this podcast that you're listening to ad free what? versions of uh any podcast that John and I do. So that includes our wine of dynamite, any of our pay-per-view reviews. So uh, those of you guys who are patrons, you guys keep the lights on here in the post wrestling universe. And uh, we want to thank you guys with as much as we can. So everything that's out there, post wrestling cafe.com. Yes. We appreciate everyone's support. Of course, a lot of uh, your, uh, you know, uh, subscriptions it goes right back into the site as well for a lot of other free content that we were able to put out there and different writers and such so you are doing more than just getting shows you're also uh, supporting post wrestling and our big gift back to you every single year the annual christmas show where usually it is a text from me to way stating are we doing the christmas show this year it's like i think we should and we are so we are back and when are we dropping this uh this gigantic piece of audio gold for all of the the holiday consumers out their way christmas eve december 24th it's a sunday this year christmas eve is on a sunday so we will be dropping our annual christmas show who will be stopping by honest to god absolutely no idea um we will figure that out but we do know that we're hoping to hear from many of you in your holiday best with the annual jingle contest all of the details are up at forum postwrestling.com what we are looking for me for you to submit is your own creation of some christmas themed jingle preferably two minutes or less preferably copyright free and we will go through all of the submissions as we do each and every year crowning the winner of the post wrestling christmas jingle contest for 2023 so uh, more details to come but all of the information up there the deadline Thursday, December 21st at noon Eastern. Get your jingle in. It gives you almost three weeks to get your jingles in, and uh, they will all be played on the show and your chance to win. So we always see some of the most uh, creative uh, followers out there uh, submit. So hoping to hear from you this year, and uh, we will pin this up on the forum so everyone can see. You can submit your theme right there in the thread, or you can just email me, john at postwrestling.com. And if you go to forum.postwrestling.com and the Christmas Jingle thread, you can see some of our previous entries, actually dating back several years, in, including our live reaction. So uh, it's always fun, and it's always a great way to entertain the entire community. So those of you with musical talents, or especially those of you maybe without any musical talents, so those are some of the most fun entries usually as well. Get a contest entry in before the 21st. Is Christmas... Uh, has has December turned into a daunting month for you, Way, or is it still pretty uh, a low key um, holiday? For work season? or for or, or for... everything, everything. Um, I I think it's it's fine, you know. Overall, how about how about you? I don't know if it's so much Christmas, but I just feel I feel like every day 
I'm putting something in my calendar that I have to do or a place I have to go or some party I have to go to. And it's all like adding up that um, I feel like I don't have any free days uh, in the next month. That's what I feel like at the moment. It's kind of every day. I, a little bit. Honestly, like, so I don't I don't know. You got to you got to uh, work hard and play hard, John. <laughs> I'm not playing hard. <laughs> I'm gonna well, sleep I, hard. That's not that's what I'm, you that's had some of these do. these Christmas parties. I, I'm sure you will get. Uh, Th these are family affairs. They're they're not the most wild uh, affairs, no. but uh, nonetheless, it's more so. Uh, you know, plotting around uh, when I'm recording, gonna record a UFC show around a Christmas party, so stuff like that. But hmm. nevertheless, I know everyone tunes in for my uh, my calendar and my agenda of events to do. But we are gonna move over to the latest news that is going on, and Mark Shapiro, the president of TKO always love these these talks way that they give and this was quite the uh the chat he had at uh one of ways um finalists when he was uh coming up with the vacation idea it was going to be the dominican republic or the ubs global media and communications conference that was going on this week the dominican republic won out and uh mark shapiro lost out on the chance to have waiting in attendance but those people in attendance got to hear mark shapiro talk for 30 minutes and quite a lot of information that was uh, contained to these 30 minutes, mainly the focus being the recent merger between WWE and UFC and the ongoing talks for the WWE Raw rights. And Shapiro stated that they, they have the time, given that the deal with the USA Network is not up until the end of September 2024. So he emphasized how they can be very flexible, very creative wherever we're going. I mean, I don't want to say WWE is being just... Um, they're pretty much stating, listen, we will go to anyone. We will move to any night of the week. We will change length. We will we'll do anything you want is pretty much been the pitch all year long for these rights. We will do anything you want. We produce the content. All you have to do is pay us and you don't have to lift a finger. That's the pitch here. They stated we can wait till after the NBA rights are done and people can figure out their finances. We can go before the NBA if they want to just get this out of the way now. We will, we will, we will just move aside for the NBA. However, works best for you. And also noting that in two years, the UFC deal will be up with ESPN, so that is on their radar. As is the streaming components with this merger with both Fight Pass and the WWE Network. The WWE Network deal in the U.S. with Peacock comes up in March of 2026. And he didn't give too much in terms of what they believe will be their strategy, but there's a lot of options of what they can do with these streaming platforms, including the idea of bundling the WWE Network and Fight Pass together to license out as well. So it's not just the, the idea of doing uh, piggyback events or even when the television rights, if they become coterminous down the road, down the road, but also these streaming packages, um, Fight Pass not the same kind of muscle that WWE Network has, but nonetheless, it is a service that does have, you know, six-figure subscribers to it. There are multiple international deals that are coming due with WWE. They mentioned Canada, which they, they seem high on, given the fact that UFC just signed a deal with Rogers Sportsnet. So not exactly tipping their hand, but it would seem to suggest that Canada is not something they are too concerned about. Um, and India as well, while UFC has Poland, India, and Bulgaria. Uh, coming uh, due. So both both companies having India deals in the not too distant future. When it came to the live event discussion, he focused on WWE and mentioned that they are still running a lot of C and D level markets. Didn't isolate any cities that he would uh, deem C or D level. Um, but he said that it's good for the brand to do these shows and get out there, but it's dilutive for the margins. A term, translate, I, I, translate. I know please. that. I know that's something where you are always talking about. It, it can't be dilutive for the margins, and there is the potential of cutting back on some of those non-televised events. So, if you remember back in 2019, before the pandemic, WWE was actively doing this, where house shows were actually starting to be a money loser mm -hmm. in quarters, and they were cutting some of the smaller towns. And that was naturally going to increase the average attendance per show because you were eliminating the smallest ones. So it seems as though, and it's not like WWE has totally ramped up its house show business since the pandemic ended. Like they're certainly running consistently, but 
it's not like every weekend we've got two crews out there doing shows Saturdays and Sundays. We had that this past weekend, but it's a it's a much less um, intensive schedule than it was in years past. But it would seem like even now they're looking at some of these house shows and maybe only looking at the biggest markets or your secondary markets and places. You know, I I would look here like they would run a Toronto, but would they even run an Ottawa? Would they run a Hamilton? Um, maybe that maybe that qualifies as B level. But if it's if it's a C level, they're going to be looking at your Toronto's and Montreal's for live events. I'm sorry to all all the people who live in C level towns. I'm what a sorry. great heel promo! You know, I'm stuck in the C level town. Yeah. I'm headlining this D market. Yeah, he my also- margins. <laughs> sorry, guys. Peterborough, Ontario is dilutive for the margins. <laughs> He does see the opportunity for more fight cards for the UFC. I was like, more fight cards? Are you out of your mind? You guys are running every weekend. He said, we're exploring them right now. You could see us move, um, adding one to two pay-per-views per year or fight night events. Also throwing out the idea of doing more cards besides like Dana White's contender series. It's like, yeah, let's let's do daily UFC events. Like, why not? We're pretty much at that pace now. So let's let's just completely clog our lives with WWE and UFC content as we uh, flood the market. I don't know if you caught the quote over the weekend, but Dana White was asked again about the PFL uh, acquiring Bellator. And he he gave like his most Dana White answer so far. He's like, he's always been kind of polite to PFL. Like they are on ESPN and such, but it's like, what do I think about it? A company that makes no money and can't sell tickets, buying another company that can't buy, that can't make money and can't sell tickets. Great idea. It sounds like a really great idea. So he just kind of dismissed it. Mark Shapiro, meanwhile, was asked about it, and he's so polite about it. He's like, you know, I believe all all tides raise all ships. Uh, A high tide raises all ships, and uh, competition is good. Um, They're kind of a lead-in for us, and he's just dancing around it. And then the last thing is, but let's make it clear, they are the B squad. (laughs) It just gets that line out there. Not wrong, but nonetheless funny from Mark Shapiro. Last couple of things here. The site fees that they are extremely aggressive towards. We got some actual figures here of what they're making for some of these shows, which even for Saudi Arabia, I don't know if they have ever, like we see the breakdown in that other section in the quarterly breakdowns, but to actually hear these numbers. So he mentioned for Australia, which is where Elimination Chamber is going to be. He mentioned that they are getting paid $16 million for quote, a combination of events. So it would suggest that it's not just elimination chamber, that that is also going to be paired with something else. I mean, SmackDown is also uh, going to be taking place there. I believe they've announced that uh, if I'm not mistaken, Um, the UFC fight night card in Saudi Arabia. Okay. A fight night, not a pay-per-view. They are getting about $20 million for that fight night card. That's why we'll be doing more of them. Yeah. For Abu Dhabi. So when Charles Oliveira got hurt and they got, uh, they were able to get Alexander Volkanovsky on like 10 days notice to fight uh, Islam Makachev. The reason they are making such bold moves to get a big main event, they're getting about $25 million for each Abu Dhabi card when they go over there. And then mentioning for the Saudi Arabia shows over $100 million for the two shows on an annual basis. And that there are quote, a long line of bidders as well. So this is their their latest fortune that they have tapped into with these site fees. And I mean, these are, I mean, if I, I would more so look at like in Australia, that if you're getting $16 million, like we know the capital that a Saudi Arabia can produce. And I don't know how many other places they're going to get that level. But if they're getting $16 million for WWE and I, I don't know what these other events necessarily are, mm-hmm. but I'm I not mean, seeing anything about SmackDown in Australia. They, I, I'm, I feel they have they have not announced uh, that either, but it it always it's tough there with the time zone as well for like you would have to tape uh, SmackDown in advance. Mm. Um, I mean, there could be a UFC card there. They just have not announced, but their their calendar is kind of up to date at this point. That would include February. But regardless, he did note a combination of events that could also be events spread over as well beyond mm-hmm. just that weekend. Um, t- Spoke about the fact that, you know, Vince's edict about keeping the ring canvas clean that he said that manifesto has been thrown out the window and pretty much we are going to splatter every inch of the WWE arena with as much as we can to make as much as we want. Mm -hmm. Um, And then um, 
again, this was all within like a 30 minute talk. We just had the latest round of cuts. And if you remember back in September, the word that came out was this is all the cuts you're going to see. Well, Mark Shapiro flat out said he knows there are way more efficiencies to be had, especially in production. And he Uh was like, dude, it was like, if, if I was a member of the production team, I would be appalled at this answer of just how brazen he was in the sense of stating, listen, I know that there are more efficiencies in the production end. I worked at ESPN for 12 years. I know of all these producers who treat every camera like it's their baby. I know how to, uh, he said, we are going to scrutinize every dollar on the production end. So I would say in in that particular sector, I would be very concerned uh, for for my job in terms of the redundancy um, that Mark Shapiro he Mark Shapiro even said there there are people that have pushed back at him in mm-hmm. the company stating like we are good and it sounds like he he knows we can squeeze more out so they are in an it's, they want to get these quote unquote synergies as high as possible and that's probably their message to the to, the, to Wall Street with the mm-hmm. stock underperforming is that we are going to get the things down as lean as we can in as many sectors as possible without uh, compromising our, our product. But uh, reiterated that if they can find the right site fees, they'll be piggybacking WWE and UFC events. And while they're not looking to buy any sports properties, um, they do want to state they're open for business and will always take uh, phone calls. So I, I found this to be an incredibly insightful uh, discussion that Mark Shapiro had with a level of, uh, kind of detail that I, I don't think we have heard in in such level, and and with Nick Khan taking more of a kind of background presence since this merger went down, um, it's it's not too often we're probably going to get some of these. Mm-hmm. And how has Wall Street reacted to any of this, if any? I I don't think at all. Like this was just a small little conference today. I don't I don't think that was anything that was going to uh, cause any any big movement. But I mean, it would. Well, the stock actually today is uh, down to seventy five fifty. It was down three and a half percent today. So I mean, this stock continues to uh, decrease. Maybe, um, maybe I I I don't know. Maybe there were a ton of people listening to this uh, UBS uh, conference today. They were just not not happy with uh, Mark Shapiro. But yeah, this the stock is. um, it continues to not uh, not perform well. Okay. Is any maybe, of this maybe really... that's Randy Orton going to SmackDown? Maybe that's that's the impact. <laughs> I mean, was any of this really all that surprising? I suppose you know the, the, these are people that wanted their hands on this company and I guess um, did a lot to get it, uh, and now they're going to try to make as much money off of it as they can. They're going to make sure that the the margins are not diluted. So mm-hmm. that's that's the key here. Next story, uh, SI.com's Justin Barrasso reporting that Kazuchika Okada's contract is up with New Japan at the end of January and that Okada is giving serious consideration to going to either WWE or AEW. And I mean, this could turn into a very big story, um, but it does kind of shine a light on what, what is the role of New Japan pro wrestling in this continued wrestling ecosystem that has two big players that are willing to negotiate and bid very high for the top talent and is new japan going to see a will osprey go uh it's one thing i would say to see a will osprey go um but it's not like we even heard like new japan was in the running to retain him other than osprey's own loyalty to work new japan into his new schedule money wise i mean this would be a big hit to Okada, but again, it, you look at AEW that that would be at least like is AEW going to become this gateway of trying to sign these names that at least allow them to have a presence in New Japan, whereas they would have virtually none in a WWE setting. Mm-hmm. I I mean, I'm surprised that um, somebody like him hasn't really entertained the idea of working for an an AEW or WWE before AEW even existed. Um, or at least like those rumblings haven't really been out there until now because, you know, like, I mean, look at Nakamura, I guess we, we don't exactly know how long, you know, WWE might've been interested in Kazushika Okada. I don't even know if we, they are right now, but you would think that they are. Um, but there's a very viable two options now for somebody like him and whether or not he intends on working for either of these promotions, everybody's getting raises off of this war 
this bidding war for talent that's out there. If a Will Ospreay can enjoy that, if a uh, you know, like who else uh, recently signed? I don't, I don't know. Like uh, 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 Randy Orton was able to enjoy that, or, or anybody else. Why wouldn't a Kazuchika Okada be able to enjoy some of that as well? Um, and you know, if New Japan can't necessarily match, then okay, then he, may, he might actually make the move he's kind of accomplished everything he could creatively now you're looking at two options in AEW and the wwe that stand a chance of respecting him creatively um it's not really tna anymore nobody will be casting him as okay though like they will treat him like the star that i think he de deserves to be so two very viable options for okada and if i'm new japan i'm certainly a bit concerned because no matter what you're gonna have to give this guy a pretty big raise yeah i mean to me this would be the one where I don't know if there would be, like Okada would be the one that if Bushi Road was going to pump in some ridiculous offer, this would be the one. But mm -hmm. I, I think at their core, I, I don't think that they would be, 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 be outbidding like some of these numbers, like the, the idea of what a WWE can offer, what an AEW can offer. And what, what they can offer, of course, is just you don't have to move your family out. You can stay in Japan full time. And now well, AEW well, one, one of them can offer that. I wouldn't say WWE can offer him that. I'm saying New Japan can offer that. Oh, New Japan. You're right. Yes. yes. But I guess you're also right that we don't know what AEW is offering their talents. We know Will Ospreay is staying in, 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 in the UK. Will they offer that same um, sort of freedom to Okada to stay in Japan? Yeah, it's you can, you can certainly customize a more workable schedule in AEW but for AEW's part if we're going to be outbidding WWE for this talent and he wants to stay in Japan I mean like how often are we getting him like it's like that's even more, more so than a Will Ospreay that can live in England as opposed to a guy living in Japan maybe maybe Okada does not want to live in Japan like maybe that's not mm -hmm. you know he has a he has Let's a family go surfing with Nakamura maybe that he could be he's at he's at 36 like if you want to make this move now is the time to do it and perhaps he wants to in, move himself to the u.s and have this this run um and, and we know be... the man is obsessed with in and out so i think he's already that's making his decision for him right there maybe he wants to do one last uh, match at st john's hall could be that as well before yes. he calls it a career anyway a real interesting story to follow and um yes we'll be uh i i think even even a bigger story next year is sort of new, new japan when it comes to like grooming their talent and are they are they going to be able to is ghetto going to be in the position that a, a paul Heyman was in 99 where you couldn't create stars fast enough before the big two would pluck them away from you and it just becomes a conveyor belt of trying to create talent. But you're also battling the perception of the big stars move on over. And if you lose Okada and Osprey in such a short time, even if they have the ability to come back for select dates, I mean, you still are sending this message that you are essentially a company that is not going to be able to keep your biggest stars if, if the big guns want them. Well, let's just maybe focus on AEW because I see that probably being a, a very, very um, maybe the more likable or, or likely option out of the two, um, just because it would involve some sort of co-promotion relationship that would allow him to stay within New Japan. If you're AEW, what is the incentive of signing Kazuchika Okada versus being able to use him for several shows a year like they already do right now? Well, I mean, it. It would come with, you know, his, your ability to promote him year round, his merchandise rights. I mean, you would be controlling him at that point. It's no longer a negotiation with New Japan on, on finishes. Like he is your guy. Um, you, you could argue at that point, if you're signing him, like what your incentive is to still allow New Japan to use him. But I, I do believe earnestly that Tony Khan wants to be a, a loyal partner in that sense, because it would be very easy for him to not allow will osprey to do new japan but he's opting to and for, for the negotiation purposes there's a benefit to him allowing for that too but once you have a john mock i'm sorry a, a will osprey and an okada on your roster is there as much incentive to even continue to work with new japan at that capacity i mean it, it, it's a question that we could be looking at years down the road where like if, if you're seeing like all this talent that is migrating to other companies and the, does New Japan still hold um, at, at present, like the, the this once a year show is a very valuable one for, for both sides. Like this is it's still a AEW versus New Japan. That concept is still one that attracts an audience for it. Now, five years down the road, if we're talking a New Japan that's going to hit 
a a wall when it comes to creating talent and losing out maybe maybe that luster is going to be lost and we these dream matches are all going to be under one roof in AEW and we aren't going to be needing New Japan to do a match with a Hiroki Goto uh coming over to uh to, to challenge for a chance How dare to you. fight for the vacant title. Dare you hey, I love Hiroki Goto, but I mean there is there's a difference here. Yeah. Yeah. Um on that front, um Kota Ibushi showed up in a Japanese wrestling ring on the weekend, but it wasn't a New Japan one. It was instead a pro wrestling Noah ring where he issued a challenge to Naomichi Marafuji, and they are going to have a match on a Noah's New Year card on January the 2nd. And this will be Abushi's first match inside of a Noah ring since 2012. So Marafuji continues his um, interesting uh, merry-go-round of opponents over mm -hmm. the past year from uh, Will Ospreay, Kota Ibushi, and this will be an interesting match to see. This is sort of the most intensive uh, singles match that Kota Bushi will have been asked um, in some time. Like we have seen him in, you know, he did uh, blood sport last year. He did the Joey Janela match, but I mean, he's, he, he's been someone that like, certainly he has not looked his same self, but this is a match that I'm curious to see him in a full fledged, like 20 minute singles match with it, with Amara Fuji. Um, what what this match looks like i am too yeah i mean i i love that he's just sort of um i mean he is signed to aew he did get the all league graphic but obviously he's somebody who maybe as an example is able to stay in japan you know exactly what we were discussing with okada somebody who could stay in japan and continue to work on other promotions like this but it's a lifestyle that i think seems to really fit for the man like he he is every bit i think um you know cowboy who just like wanders off in his own path and he has arrived at pro wrestling noah uh with you know a guy who's gained a lot of buzz for having these sort of one-off attraction matches and now michi Murafuji this year so i'm looking forward to the match yeah that's that's gonna be a crazy week i mean stardom has their dream queendom card on december 29th uh you have this noah card that is shaping up to be a really strong card and then you have of course wrestle kingdom uh all japan has their uh, year opening show Tokyo Joshi Pro has a big show that week. I mean, that's going to be a crazy week. Um, AEW has the pay per view that kicks off that week. I mean, that first week, last week of uh, 2023, first week of uh, 2024 is going to be uh, very, very busy. AEW All In tickets, the latest from WrestleTix, has the number at 36,057 distributed. Nine months out from the show. This comes after uh, last week's pre sale and then the on sale for the public uh, that began on friday so in very good shape i i would say so what is the exact number that this will end at on august 25th 60 one two eight 60 one two eight yeah okay do you see a potential of this you're not going to make a guess you're just going to throw me out there like that you pick you picked my guess the exact number all right that's what i wrote down uh in, in fact Yes. Um, I feel this is going to be the most focused upon number for the next nine months mm -hmm. that we sure. really won't be able to um, glean a whole lot until I would say six weeks out from the show. Well, we don't even know what the card is. We don't like outside of like, you know, knowing who's going to be participating. We we really have no idea what the storylines are going to be like as they head there. A lot of it is just simply being sold off of, I think, the value of the name all in and maybe some of the reputation that the show has gained from last year. Um, so it's it's really hard to predict. When can I log on to YouTube and see a headline of a video that reads all in bombs at Wembley stadium? Can this um, number be equated to how can I, how can I dress this up that this, this is this, this bombed. They bombed at Wembley. Um, I mean, you can't until the show's done, right? I feel, so, I, I feel this number will be um, manipulated in many different ways. I, I'm just this one right now. Oh yeah, this one for sure. But I mean, comparing where they were at this time last year, is is this not a very good result? It's a very good result. I'm just, I'm just trying to see how how people can take a number and just manipulate it to whatever their narrative well, is. You could say anything you want. Well, other numbers in uh, pro wrestling this week. We've got the end of a a pair of a uh, tag leagues this week. We've got the New Japan uh, version, which is the World Tag League, that will end on Sunday, and we have. A round robin match for each team remaining. So the A block will wrap up on Wednesday, the B block on Thursday. So the A block is down to 
uh, Shane Haste and Mikey Nichols, who have 10 points and will take on Alex Coughlin and Gabe Kidd. If Haste and Nichols, and it's the top two teams in each block that advance to the semifinals on Friday, finals on Sunday. Then you have Ishii and Yano, who are alive with eight points, taking on Hanare and Great Okan, who are eliminated. So the most likely outcome is that um, we would have uh, the winner of Haste and Nichols against Coglin and Kidd. And then Ishii and Yano, if they win, they would have a tiebreaker over Haste and Nichols, but not against Coglin and Kidd. There is also a way that there could be a four-way tie for second place that I don't see occurring, but um, who knows? Maybe they'll, they'll just get wild this year. The B block is a lot more simpler because on Thursday, Lance Archer and Alex Zane take on El Fantasmo and Hikuleo. Taichi and Yuya Uemura take on Hiroki Goto and Yoshihashi. The two winners advance to the semifinals. So that was uh, pretty um, easy to uh, calculate. And then the All Japan World Tag League. We have three teams tied with 10 points with uh, Katsuhiko Nakajima and Hokuto Omori, Suama and Hideki Suzuki, and the World Tag Team Champions, Jun and Rei Saito. Uh, they all have 10 points. They're all in separate matches on Wednesday's final. Uh, Kento Miyahara and Yuma Aoyagi are taking on Nakajima and Omori. They have nine points, so they are still alive and could also win. So you do have the potential here for spoilers to take out uh, two of the teams, and then it just comes down to Nakajima and Omori against Miyahara and Aoyagi. Nakajima's won this tournament the last three years with uh, Aoyagi as a partner and uh, and uh, Tokuya Nomura last year. So uh, a few options there. It's been an entertaining tournament for the most part with some of the teams, and Katsuhiko Nakajima has been um, just this great breath of fresh air in all Japan. However... Long he he will be challenging for the triple crown on that um, that that uh, that show that kicks off the uh, the new year for all Japan as well. So that tournament wraps up on Wednesday. Ratings notes from Friday: SmackDown fell to two million forty four thousand viewers, a point five nine. This was going against the Pac twelve Championship that did nine point one million viewers on the Fast National. So this led to SmackDown's lowest viewership since August of two thousand and twenty two. Uh, although Randy Orton's quarter uh, in the final 15 minutes was the peak of the show, doing 2.32 million viewers, 941,000 in the demo that were at the edge of their seat of where Randy Orton would sign um, and grew the 18 to 34 audience as well um, this week, uh, as well as they returned to Fox after FS1 last week. So that was uh, the SmackDown news. Rampage. This has become the new uh, like Canadian ratings. I cannot predict Rampage at all. They had four matches. Um, I don't think they promoted any of them. Um, to any, They didn't promote anything on Dynamite last Wednesday, as I recall, when we came on. Like, I think they had only announced collision matches. Nothing for Rampage. Um, you did have Ric Flair and Sting appearing on this show. Um, so, I mean, if you were on their social media, you would have seen this. And maybe, maybe they can get credit for this. But they did 348,000 viewers, their highest viewership since October 13th, and a .10 in the demo. So, uh, and this was also moving back to its normal slot after they were on Saturday, uh, the week prior. So that is, that is a super busy poster. Well, it's, it's one of their graphics. They, they just put out to compile everything. Um, so that you have one graphic to look at, to see what's going to be on the show. It's, it's more of an of infographic, I would say. I guess so. Yeah. Well, there you go, everybody, all your ratings, notes, everything up to date and, Yes, we will be moving on to WWE Raw tonight at the MVP Arena, where MVP has been absent from WWE programming for a long time. What's happened to him and Omos? Oh, that's a great question. I haven't even thought about um, Omos in a while. You know what? Omos, um, great SEO content, Omos. Oh, yes. Him getting married. That thing did huge on a our big website. Draw. Yes, yeah. Omos. Omos might get a write-in vote for me of like biggest draw of the year, B biggest website mm -hmm. traffic. Um, Omos. Okay. WWE needs to do an Omos wedding angle. That's what we've learned. Oh my goodness! Can website. you imagine? Well, tonight they were in Albany, New York. Six thousand seven hundred eighty-five tickets distributed, and WrestleTix noted that over the past week they moved almost seventeen hundred tickets, which is a pretty sizable number to move in this last week. And I would think that a lot of people buying those tickets were doing so of the impression that you're getting at least CM Punk, if not Punk and Randy Orton after last week's show. 
which if you watch SmackDown, I think you could probably come to the conclusion, okay, Randy Orton's probably not on Raw. Punk was never advertised, so you can't say WWE was being deceptive, but I could absolutely understand last week you watch Raw, you see these two big returns, and you're someone in or around Albany, and you saw a big spike in ticket sales. I could see why people were showing up tonight, assuming that at least Punk would be there. But, um, I mean, I guess that's just the tricky part of um, how how hard you promote something and versus not promoting something. And you can't you can't say that WWE misled. They did not promote Punk. Now, is Albany an A-level or B-level or C-level town? You know what? If it was a level, I think they would have given CM Punk the call. I think, I think, mm. I think Albany is a strong B. It's a good B level. Strong B. Okay. Yeah. Not good enough. Yeah. Obviously. This was a, well, it wasn't a D level Drew here. Uh, Drew shows up to start the show and refers to this company losing its mind and that people get fired, released, and then come back and are instantly forgiven. And that starts a CM Punk chant. And Drew just says, I could be talking about anyone. <laughs> Very Marty nice. Gennetti. He's maybe uh, starting a program. With. <laughs> Jeff he Hardy. points out uh, beating Jay Uso, yet he's getting a title shot tonight, and how Jay was quick to apologize to Randy Orton, but not to him, and says that Jay, your time is coming, and calls out Sami Zayn, who comes and says, "Whatever you have to say to me, say to my face." And Drew says, "You know, of all the people, you're the one that deserved to get screwed by the bloodline. You were their lap dog, and then you screwed them, so you deserved what you got." And Zane says, you and I are nothing alike. I'm not delusional. I don't point fingers at other people for their own shortcomings. And I lost in front of my family in Montreal, but I stayed hungry. And that drove me to the main event of WrestleMania. And then Drew cut him off. He said, whoa, 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 whoa. You were in the main event of night one of <laughs> WrestleMania. That's not the main event of WrestleMania. Zane is like, oh, contraire, mon frere. And says, Drew, are you making your family proud? And Drew was furious and said, basically, I'm going to murder you. Ring the bell. Uh, I thought this was a great segment. You know, in one week, I think they created a really great feud between these two based off of the backstory that already existed for the both of them. They found their um, shared trauma of losing in front of their home countries, thanks to the bloodline. And they contrasted each other by having, I guess, very different reactions to, you know, that trauma. And I thought Drew was, again, great here. I thought Sammy was great here. Um, and I think, like, Drew is pretty much a full heel now. He's playing it in his character slightly differently here. Where tonight, I really felt he was kind of hamming up the performance, you know. He's almost like, um, he's almost a bit more like an action movie villain now. In a good way. Like, his logic and his truths are still very much intact you know him pointing out that sammy deserved to um get screwed by the bloodline makes a lot of sense when he lays it all out there you join the group okay and then you screwed them of course you deserve it um it makes a lot of sense but the way he plays it is just wonderfully entertaining and very charismatic so we're, we're definitely at second stage drew mcintyre right now one of the things that has jumped out at me as a philosophical difference between Vince McMahon and Paul Levesque was, and, and this wasn't always the case, but it was prevalent enough, especially in the Cena era, when Cena would like lose a big match on pay-per-view. And the idea was like the next night he would come out on Raw and he wouldn't sell the, the defeat. It would be like, we don't want to make Cena look weak. And it would just be, you know, it became a joke that he would laugh things off or he would just be fine or e even selling like a big um, injury or something like that. Paul Levesque, and on this show alone, we had Drew McIntyre and Sami Zayn and Shinsuke Nakamura and Cody Rhodes, and mm -hmm. both stories are playing off of the agony of defeat and how a loss can send someone off of their path, but it's like this defining moment in their career that they are now on a mission to rectify. And mm -hmm. there is so much more storytelling from a loss than a win. And I think that is something that Paul Levesque is very in tune with. And it and it comes across in his storytelling. A win, you know, I'm, we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves. But a win is the end of the story, is it not? You know, without the chase, there's sort of almost not nothing. You're, you're going to have to create a new chase. And no matter what, like in order to, to build drama, especially for the baby faces and even the heels as well, they need something to strive for. 
and and it's that sort of longing for that ultimate win at WrestleMania or the champion or for the championship that I think motivates these guys and 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 gives them this wonderful story for them to clash uh, about. So we go into our first match, which this might be a record of the six matches that we got tonight on Raw. Every one of them was announced in advance. It's amazing. I have graphics for all of them. Crazy. <laughs> I mean, just um, could you imagine this three years ago? Conversely, like um, a lot of AEW shows are waiting till after the last broadcast to announce. You know? Or we're getting a um, uh, an impromptu match with El Hilo Del Vikingo and Kip Sabian. A standby match. Standby, right. Drew McIntyre and Sami Zayn. They go through a commercial break and Zayn ends up, uh, Drew runs into the shoulder, runs his shoulder into the post. And then Zayn comes down and is favoring his like ankle and leg. And this would play into the whole kind of focus of the, of the match with this injury he's dealing with. Drew catches his Pescado and drives Sammy onto the desk. We go through another commercial break. Drew goes for his inverted Alabama slam that is turned into a victory roll and then a sit-out power bomb for a two count. Zayn comes back with a sunset bomb and then Drew stops the blue thunder bomb, hits a Glasgow kiss, and as he signals for the Claymore, Zayn cuts him off with a boot, hits the blue thunder bomb, Drew kicks out, and then Zayn pops off the second rope on, with a leapfrog, comes down on the injured leg and it gives out. And this guy, he's got like the blood of Seth Rollins going through him as he's limping. He's just eyeing Drew, and he's trying to go for a dive to the floor, but his leg will just not allow him to even put weight on it. But, man, if I could only hit this this Topekun hero. And Drew chop blocks him, and then um, he chop blocks him from behind as the referee is checking on him, and then Drew, uh, pretty much tying this into his promo with Rollins, showed no remorse th this time around, hit him with the Claymore, and pinned Sammy in 20 minutes and 8 seconds. Mm-hmm. I thought Drew did a great job of wrestling as a full-on heel in this match, taking advantage of his size to bully his opponents aggressively, taking advantage of Sammy's injury. Crowd really got into it. I really enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, Sammy is somewhat protected. I mean, the finish itself is somewhat protected. This was not what I think you could classify as a clean finish due to Sammy's injury. So enough room for a rematch down the road. Uh, but immediately from the start of the show, it, it it already feels like Drew is the new nucleus of Raw that all the baby faces are revolving around. Yes. Is this going to be a chronic injury for Sami Zayn? Is this his back injury? Oh, we'll see. I mean, look, look like a pretty bad one tonight. Maybe Shinsuke Nakamura is going to diagnose the, the mysterious arthritis he has found in Sami's knee. Ooh, oh, no. Byron speaks with Shayna Baszler with Zoe Stark. She notes she put Nia on the shelf two years ago by breaking her arm. And she's going to remind her of that and destroy her limb from limb. Then we had a video package on Jay Uso reflecting on his match with Roman Reigns at SummerSlam. And um, I wanted like the honest version of this where it was the biggest singles match of my career. We booked it to go way too long. We should have gone 25 tops, but we burnt out the crowd. It was a <laughs> long show. And tonight we're going to we're going to keep it to a hard 23. So he said that that title shot, it was ripped away from him by his brother, Jimmy Uso. And that hurt more than you could ever know. And he couldn't be around this business anymore. He was done until he got a call from Cody who told him you couldn't quit. You need to create your own legacy. And now Jay is fighting for himself. I'm starving and I'm ready to eat. And he's going to prove to everyone and himself why they call him main event. Jay Uso. Mm -hmm. I thought this was a hell of a promo from Jay. I, I would maybe go as far as to say maybe the best promo I've heard him since his singles run on Raw. And this was a pre-produced video. We've I've yet to hear like this quality of promo from Jay in a live setting. So I do wonder how much the pre-production helped bring this out of him. Um, but it's you amazing know, when you have a, an idea of where you're going next week and you can do all this stuff in the in the seven days beforehand when you know what's happening and not the afternoon of. Totally. Absolutely. But, you know, this is the type of promo where I think it really benefited from having footage of what he's talking about shown, you know, um, and it, this in a few minutes basically recap the entire Jey Uso singles run story. He tried to go for the championship. His brother turned on him. He was about to quit the business, but Cody brought him back onto Raw. Now he's going to try to, you know, win that championship he couldn't get back over the summer. So really well done video. Zayn is being tended to in the back and he gets attacked by Drew again. 
and yells at Zane for bringing up his family, says, I'm nothing like you. You brought this on yourself. And then he stomps the knee and Jay comes in to check on Sami Zayn. So the way this was set up is that I, I, I didn't take this as necessarily a write-off for Sammy, but an injury that they're going to probably continue with here. I expect him to be gone for at least a week, don't you? I mean, this was a pretty severe, you know, leg injury type of beatdown. Yeah, it could be. If not longer, you know, because I would say there's not much reason Sammy needs to be back because Drew has already set up programs with Rollins, with Jay. Uh, Sammy could be the one after that, you know. So, again, um, they've done a great job of setting Drew up for his programs against every big baby face on the show. Um, I guess Cody remains at, at some point, but that's enough to carry you all the way till WrestleMania. So pretty, pretty big beat down here. Can you see that being the, the WrestleMania match? Sammy and Drew, or uh, or Drew and Jay, you know, what are, what are the plans? You think? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of options of what you can do with, with Drew if mm -hmm. he's sort of outside of that title picture. But I'll, I'll tell you, I think that they have a really great men's Royal Rumble of all these different um, yeah. pieces that you can put together, and like to me, it should be like Jimmy eliminating Jay, and that should set those two up to be the mania program for, for those two. Um, yeah. Drew, Drew, there's, there's certainly different options of, of where, where you can go. Like um, Drew and punk is an option too, after the promo today, you know? Um, so he's got like, Drew is just like, they're really, really just like, you know, using him really well here. Saxton speaks with Becky Lynch and Nia Jax walks in and asks if you were referring to me last week about, being number one on your list. And Becky says, I owe you a receipt. We never did our program. And Nia says, cool. Once I squash Shayna, I'm all yours. And Michael Cole refers to the punch heard round the world that Nia delivered. Mm -hmm. I totally forgot that we never actually got this match after, you know, the nose break. And I don't know how many of us at the time were really upset about that. Um, she kind of moved on to bigger and better things, but um, you, know, you should be paying this off. Absolutely. Why wouldn't you? I'm sure this is one of the reasons why Nia was brought back. The receipt match. Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler are former two-time women's tag team champions, as it was Shania. Noted. Shania, that's right. And uh, Urinagi is hit by Nia Jax. Baszler fires back with, with kicks, delivers one to the head, but then run over with an avalanche and a senton. Jax climbs for the Annihilator, but Baszler grabs her by the leg and Germans her off the turnbuckle. She's really trying to get the audience going here. Applies the Kirafuda clutch. Jax is fighting it and then just drops back on top of Shayna, breaks free and drags her to the corner for the Annihilator. 12 minutes and 11 seconds. Another dominant win for Nia Jax, which is what they should be doing as they... It almost feels like Becky is maybe like the big man. We, we've been talking about Rhea Ripley, but... Um, I mean, you could do a detour with Nia somehow getting over on Becky and do Rhea and Nia, but um, mm -hmm. it, it kind of feels like Becky is a bigger opponent. It seems like Becky and Nia maybe at Rumble, and then, you know, Becky... Do you think they can hold it off that long? Yeah, I think so. Two Talking months? Like seven, eight weeks? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Well, a lot of could... time to, to talk. I mean, it could be rematches. You're right. They could do it on TV, and then both of them could enter the Rumble. Actually, in I, fact, I thought I would... Cody and Shinsuke, I was like, man, we're going to get like a month of this, but we're just going to the match next week. Yeah, well, we need we need stuff for TV, John. You know, it's a rights deal coming up, right? So, uh, yeah, I, I think they're, they've done a pretty good job of building uh, Nia very basically here. You know, like, again, her in-ring does not look very good at all, but her matches, I think, are well laid out. They're often, you know, pretty engaging in terms of, setting up an underdog story and then having Naya basically just, you know, squash. So it, it's a very simple rematch that they're building up to. I know this is going to sound ridiculous to people listening to this. Um, and it wouldn't be like the idea I would have been advocating for, but like, we don't know what the Nia Jax, like the big, like what you're building her up for, whether it's Becky, whether it's Rhea Ripley, but you could certainly argue that, was there more mileage out of Nia Jax being the one to get this big win over Ronda Rousey versus Shayna Baszler that got this win? I mean, granted, it was you had this this history behind them, but it just feels like Shayna Baszler is just in her same role. They're not going to go past a certain level with Shayna Baszler. Right. Um, well, Ronda was a heel and and Nia was she? Being, 
she we, we had this debate back and forth each week <laughs> you're right it was, was. A, it's a great question whether either way I, I don't think she would have gotten over enough to have anaya beating rada feel like it's any sort of like you know sympathetic or at least big victory or heat getting victory for naya jacks i don't think um i so i think the fact that they didn't have they didn't do more with Shayna might come down to just how poorly that match was received or maybe just Shayna's continued limitations on the microphone which i still think are quite quite a lot i mean she sounded great in that final like in those video packages with ronda but beyond that hasn't really shown that much glimpse of i think that sort of you know quality you're looking for in a top women star um not that she's been giving much attention either yeah i just just watching their interview backstage and we have Shayna baszler who was given the, this big win and then Zoe Stark with this idea that she was going to benefit from this Trish uh, alliance and then attacking Trish at the end of that. And it just seems as though they're like, well, just... you can argue Zoe is at least like a known commodity now, you know, they, they she's known enough th to the point where they could justify putting her in a title match on a PLE, you know? Yeah. She's... Would she have had that without the Trish story? Uh, yeah, I think I feel like that was just like the opponent of the yeah. month for Rhea Ripley. I didn't yeah, strike it like it's it wasn't a major opponent. Mm -hmm. um, They've had trouble like getting people up there for sure. But Naya, like, would you agree is sort of like, listen, they're booking her really strong. Like, yeah. it wouldn't be my person that I would have rehired and put in this position, but they did. They chose it. So it's like once you've made that commitment, we'll book her strong. And they are like they are like it should be meaningful when one of these like Rio or Becky, whoever it is, if both get this big win over Naya, like they're getting as much as they can out of her. Becky runs down and Jax just and exits the ring. They recap CM Punk's return, plugged his appearance for SmackDown on Friday at the tribute to the troops special. And then my favorite backstage segment of the year, DIY is hanging out with Candice LeRae and Indy Hartwell. They stand at attention as Kaiser and Vinci walk in and Kaiser says, look at this lovely couple. Vinci, couple of losers. <laughs> I laugh so hard at this. <laughs> and they just the the four of them laugh, and they're like, "You better not make Gunther upset." And Kaiser looks at Vinci. This is important. Don't mess this up. Vinci says, "You too." <laughs> God, uh. Can we get an AI generated <laughs> interaction of six people yeah. that have absolutely no human qualities in terms of dialogue exchange? The, these are great actors when it comes to combat. I, I don't know if, um, you know, we've ever considered pro wrestlers great actors in these sort of segments. Yeah. Couple of losers. <laughs> yeah. DIY against Ludwig Kaiser. Uh, Two out of three lines recited match. Uh, we get Gargano landing. Uh, on Kaiser the and Vinci, is the two of them. Sorry, sorry. Kaiser and Vinci, yes, against Gargano. Two out of three falls. Two out of three falls. So they the meet, meet in the middle was interrupted when Gargano is pulled to the floor and then Kaiser rolls up Ciampa for the first fall. Then they get the heat on Gargano. He comes by, uh, gets hit with a drive-by from Vinci off the floor. DIY stop an Imperial Bomb, and this allows Gargano to roll up Vinci, this time Ciampa grabbing Kaiser from the apron. So it's basically subdue the partner and then roll up finish. So we go through our first two falls, and then they get into it in the third fall with a more extended match. Uh, this time, they try the same finish where Vinci this time gets set, uh, run into the steps after he stops the meet in the middle. And so Kaiser rolls up Gargano, but he kicks out Ciampa and Gargano re regroup and hit the meat in the middle, 15 minutes and 10 seconds. And Vinci is on the floor and says, you need to explain this to Gunther, not me. I thought this was a really excellent match, you know, um, for the first time, maybe in, in a few weeks, it felt like DIY was that same special black and gold, like, you know, um amazing tag team again and i i thought it was very much like a, a high quality tag team match that uh, the four of them brought so great create crowd reaction for them i felt and uh a good week for i would say the tag team division overall yeah michael cole noted diy do it yourself Thank Claire, you. he made sure to yeah. didn't want it, that to be lost on people natalia knox are approached by chelsea green and piper niven 
and they tell Natalia to move on from Knox. She's not your meal ticket. And Knox did the most unconvincing leap towards uh, Chelsea Green and had to be held back by Natalia. And Natalia said, someone needs to put a muzzle on that mutt. That mangy mutt. Uh, yes. Then we go to the Creeds who are squatting Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods on their shoulders. And the New Day put them over for becoming the number one contenders. Alpha Academy come in. They're offering advice to Julius and Brutus, but they note they have their secret weapon, Ivy Nile, who can handle Rhea Ripley. And then Maxine, she's also been working on her squatting skills as she lifts up Akira Tozawa and starts squatting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, strong. <laughs> Listen, this is a way to get the creeds on TV without having them do and say much. You know, the, the whole purpose of everything right now is to push the creeds to the top. And they're not very. I mean, you think the acting was bad in the DIY Imperium segment. This the creeds alone, I think, would have probably been a lot worse. So they're just using people like the New Day, using people like Alpha Academy to be entertaining on screen and just having the creeds in the background get the attention. So when Chad Gable came in and said shoosh, he was being literal with Julius and Brutus. Um, a little bit, yeah. Let us do the talk. Just squat, yeah. The new thing they've come up with for our truth is that he is trying to get into the judgment day. So he's hanging around in their clubhouse and messes up their like TV that is out of like 1978 and thinks he's in the judgment day. JD kicks him out and Priest is upset about Drew. Dominic informs him Rhea said no one touches Drew, but Priest informs us Rhea is not here tonight and tells them to go handle the creeds. So we had no Balor and no Ripley on this show, and Damian Priest was uh, trying to run things. Um, he didn't even really have Priest on the show either. No, he just did a few of these backstage segments. I mean, wasn't um, much of a role for him other than being the de facto leader and then these two failed in their tag match later. well listen it, 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 it's it, it, sorry it's 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 albany it's the capital i don't know if you knew this john the state capital but um i don't know not much Ballard and ripley they speech. don't do the b-towns that's it no um tell no. us when we're in cleveland next week <laughs> I kind of like the idea that Truth gets to stick around the the Judgment Day as sort of like their version of Sami Zayn in the Bloodline. Now, um, maybe the upside is not as much for you know an R Truth as it was for a Sami Zayn, but I think like a bit of levity brought to like these overly I don't know gothic serious dudes in the the Judgment Day can really help make these segments maybe that much more entertaining. I find them typically like fine but kind of one note having our truth in there and having like somebody like priest react to him i think i think has been fun so far okay well we'll see where this goes this looks to be his new 24 7 home <laughs> we'll see katana chance and caden carter against tegan knox and natalia with chelsea green and piper niven on commentary um natalia did this crazy deadlift of katana chance like you see all these workout videos that like Natalia's doing all this like uh, clean and jerk. Yeah. Yeah. She does like full clean and jerk with Katana chance right up over her head. And they note that Katana chance is the, uh, the lightest performer on the roster. I think is what Cole said. It dude, Natalia lifted her up. Like she was the lightest woman on the roster. This was a very impressive looking spot. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I mean, um, was it effective? I don't know if it was effective. It was definitely uh, it was impressive. It looked cool. Sure. It was very trusting. I would say if, if I was Katana chance, I'd be like, you're going to do what? Yeah. Uh, then Katana chance was like, Hey, let me go over my finish. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that was a, uh, their, their meeting in the middle uh, chance. hits a code breaker on the Natalia. Then they Natalia stops a double team superplex and just sends both chance and Carter off the buckle to the mat. Carter lands a kick. And then it's Katana chance with her handstand onto the shoulders of Carter and splashes off onto Natalia in four minutes and 50 seconds. I don't know what the hell this is called, but it desperately needs a name. It looks mm. incredible. Yeah. Um, last chance. Um, Kat, uh, Kat, 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 yeah. Yeah. It's, it's up to them to decide. Yeah. I mean, decent match. No reaction, unfortunately, in ring. I think Chance and Carter have been really good, but they've received very little support um, on, with everything else. Not much promo time. 
like occasionally they'll say a few words in these backstage skits involving the rest of the tag team division, but no real focus, certainly no real storyline. So they how about you call their be... finisher then? Give divas a chance. Uh, yeah, yeah, throw the hashtag in there. Absolutely, bring it back. That should be the tag team name. No, it shouldn't. Um, but you know, I hope they actually are going to tell a bit of story and give a bit of personality to the two now. Beyond like they love to party. Go. Yeah, they love a lot to of party. And that's yeah. that's all we know about them. They went to a concert once in NXT. Mm -hmm. They love it. Yeah. Cody Rhodes comes out. He says, When I was a little boy, I first saw the poison mist when the great Muda did it. So we're explaining this is poison that he absorbed last week. Yeah. And when I experienced it last week, my fears were justified. And you know how poisonous this mist is? How? It can cause memory loss, such as when Malachi Black delivered it to Cody Rhodes two years ago. Oh, that's a whole different universe, man. Come on. That's an alternate reality. I don't think he is. That's not the same same guy. Is it? Okay. Well, maybe it is. He blames himself for not listening to the clues that Nakamura was dropping. And I've got a big bullseye on my back. So he demands Nakamura explain himself or we can fight. The lights go down. There's a spotlight on Cody. Cody was probably having, uh, you know, premonitions of, uh, wait a minute. I was misted by someone that turned the <laughs> lights out on me. And Nakamura appears on the screen. Last week, I made your eyes burn. But tonight, I will open them. <laughs> The path we've taken is the same story. Like you, I climbed the mountain and we get footage of Nakamura winning the Rumble in 2018 and Cody in 2022. Like you, I could see the top and we see Nakamura facing AJ at WrestleMania in New Orleans and Cody last year against Reigns. But both of us failed and suffered the same humiliation. The devil in your mind whispers that you'll never make it back there. But now you have awoken me inspired me and i am here to unburden you to step into your shoes and take that story off your hands i never got to finish my story so now i will finish yours mm -hmm. it's like man whoever uh this is going to be the best uh how many years did we talk about subtitles way like it became a running gag with you and i about subtitles this yeah. is like the most brilliant yet simple thing that they have tapped into with Nakamura, that it's like revitalized this man's entire career. Well, I mean, I, I'm UFC, more interested in his promos than I am his matches. Every other sport does it, like UFC especially. You know, they they've made use of su subtitles in their countdown specials perfectly, and and you know so much more. I think about the participants as a result. For whatever reason, WWE has complete. Oh, we know the reason. Vince, he he probably. <laughs> Doesn't like reading, you know, who's going to want to read all that shit. Um, but it's been I'm, I'm Japanese, sir. Okay. How about instead of explaining your native language, how about we turn you into a four-year-old that speaks Japanese because foreigner... how about we make you low blow your opponent repeatedly? That's the only language that's universal. His Balls. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, this is just a clear philosophical change between Paul Levesque and, and, and Vince McMahon and somebody like a Shinsuke Nakamura has benefited so much. I would go as far as to say it's either between like Nakamura or, or Drew, um, but Nakamura might have had the best promo on this show. OK, and for a guy who was awesome, I thought this was who, so great for a guy who didn't speak at, at all, like, you know, maybe six months before this, it, it really is, is quite incredible. And, and it's a lot of credit to him. It's a lot of credit for the writers that are helping him craft this story. They found, like you said, John, you know, similar to what they did with Drew and Sammy, they found a way to link Nakamura and Cody Rhodes through their shared failure of winning a title at WrestleMania. Um, and it's, it was very, and you're going into something from, like almost six years ago, like mm -hmm. you're going way back by WWE standards. Like you would have really had to fish to like come up with something. And they got some like for a one week build. Like this was a great uh, setup. I, I just thought the segment was excellent. Well, when people have, I guess, wrestled for so long, there's going, there's bound to be some connection there. And, but yeah, it's up to like the writers to be able to draw that out. And it's almost like a wonder why we were so easily impressed buy something like this oh my god they brought something back from six years i, I say this all the time place. it's like dude the bar for like great storytelling and wrestling it's so low that you yeah. don't understand how easy it is to be great 
You mm-hmm. only have to do uh, like, dude, if you hit a single, it will be treated like a triple. Like yeah. that is the level that especially this audience in WWE has been nurtured on. It's like, oh my God, he brought up something from 2018. Yeah. Where, where's the Emmy? Like this is yeah. simple stuff that up. will, it, it's <laughs> like people talk about, Ren, you wrestling fans are so negative, dude. When you hit something at just a base level, they will reward you in kind for just crumbs that you feed them. That's, that's absolutely it. But I also love the way they so simply sort of like, um, I, I think, diluted the message into one line. The the fact that you couldn't finish your story, so I'm going to finish it for you. You so, know, isn't, isn't that wonderfully poetic, you know, coming here from Nakamura? Cody just says, if you think our stories are the same, well, I don't rate or respect you, Shinsuke, and tells him to prove it and come prove it if you think we are the same. And mm-hmm. this will happen next week in Cleveland. And dude, there's a this is a dead month, and they could certainly extend this if 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 needed. Like you, you've got two months until the rumble, and Cody's not doing anything. You can get a lot more than a week out of this. With the amount of build that I think, you know, led up to this point with all the riddles, I can't imagine like they'll just end it just in a week's time. So, yeah, I can see them extending this one. Um, And it's like there's so much more story, I think, to be told, too, you know. So, yeah, I think this one. And what if what if they have what if last week they had just done the attack and then next week he missed Cody and forces him? He's he can't see. For his daughter's Christmas. He's blind. Ooh, I love it. That's it's exactly. like junkyard dog being blinded by Ted DiBiase and he can't see his child. Yeah. Exactly the thing Nakamura would do. Yeah. Pierce is with Jay Uso and they're evaluating Sami Zayn. Jay says he's going to take care of Drew as well. Pierce says, focus on Rollins. And then Gunther walks in and wants to talk about his next opponent. Pierce has got some ideas. And that's how things are left. Dominic Mysterio and JD McDonough against the Creeds. Dude, they uh, Dominic and JD were really great here as foils for mm-hmm. the Creeds. And dude, Julius Creed was just um man, he th- the spot of this match was him getting the tag, and he just did non-stop overhead belly to belly suplexes that this crowd got so into. Um this is kind of like be- Suplex City, but like a baby face version. Yeah. This is, yeah, like the blown up version too, because this dude can do this, but mm. if this becomes his calling card, there's going to come a time he's like, man, why did, why did I sign up for this? Like, this looks so <laughs> taxing, but the guy is an incredible athlete, and uh, like he just hit suplex after suplex and was the key part of the match for me. It, it was certainly the big spot of the match, absolutely, yeah. Our truth is out there as well at ringside. JD blocks a poison run. So truth was wearing Rhea Ripley's top. Oh, was he? Okay. Yeah. Um, then on the second try, he hits it, uh, but then Dominic yanks Brutus to prevent the Brutus ball. And then on the floor, Brutus hits a pounce to Dominic, sends him flying over the desk, and Julius just hoists up McDonough for the Brutus ball, and the Creeds win in 1050. They really made the Creeds look like monsters in mm-hmm. this match. And I think they found like Brutus. I think it's like less is more. Have him do his big pounce, do the Brutus ball, and let let Julius do a lot of the literal and figurative heavy lifting uh, mm-hmm. as well. I thought this was like a good balance of these two. I thought they looked. I thought this was a really good match and set the creeds up as legitimate title challenges. Uh, the crowd reactions I thought were really strong for for the creeds, especially for that belly to belly you know sequence here. So. Definitely still a bit rough around the edges, and I think you know, in terms of a promo and 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 backstage acting ability, probably still. This is not a finished act. No, so they're kind of caught in between this weird space where like they're too good for NXT in the performance center, but on the main roster, there's still a lot for them to develop. Yet at the same time, you also don't want to start them from the ground up because they have that momentum, and the crowds are buying them as like a legitimate you know tight title contender. So they're being pushed strong. I don't necessarily see them winning. The titles, man. Who remind me? Uh, it's from the Judgment Day. I mean, it's that possible. It's a tag team championship, right? They could, but they could. They also have to be careful of not overexposing them. So, we'll see how they handle it. Randy Orton joining SmackDown was recapped. Why would they run this on Raw? Um, you know, just the demand. I would like, say. Well, look how I lost out on this guy. He uh, yeah. put, picked the other group. 
Rollins is with Pierce and Pierce explains, I have invited CM Punk to raw next week and I plan to sign him. And Rollins just laughs off. I don't care when it blows up in your face. I'll be proven right. And Jay walks in stating it's my night and, and Rollins just gets serious. I'm going to stomp your head in the mat. The first chance I get, Jay says, well, I'm going to kick your face off. Contract signings and, you know, uh, decisions do well on TV. So they're doing it with Punk. So what's he going to be doing on Friday? Just to listen to uh, all this, they're going to try and draft him into the army, <laughs> right? To the troops, <laughs> tribute yeah. to the troops. Yes, so they're going to try and get him to sign. Okay. And, uh, and next week's show is in Cleveland, the same venue that he walked out on in 2014, and where he fought Mickey Gall. That is correct. An A A town, I guess. Uh, Mark Shapiro would say. Yeah, it's a yeah. it's an A market. They're not they're not <laughs> diluting the margins next week mm. with Punk yeah. on the show. Dominic and JD meet up with Damian Priest. He's like, what happened? JD blames our truth, but then Dom cuts him off. He says, no, it wasn't our truth. The creeds are the real deal, and you and Finn need to be ready. <laughs> this is a most serious line from Dominic. And uh, it was it was a good line. It was like Priest was like digesting the fact that, yeah, this uh, these creeds ain't uh, nothing to F with. And in the back, Gunther is scolding Ludwig Kaiser. Mm -hmm. Yeah, could be scolding, could be... Here's what you got to do to that Vinci guy. That piece of Vinci. Oh. So next week, uh, they've just announced Punk and Cody against Shinsuke Nakamura in Cleveland. So last half hour of the show is mainly Seth Rollins and Jay Uso for the world heavyweight title. They mentioned that Umaga died on this date in 2009 and Jay is dedicating this match to him. Hmm. So they go to the break early. Jay is uh, Jay hits a backbreaker, as Michael Cole reminds us of the debilitating back injury that I, I think Seth has got like stem cell treatment or something Muscle. in storyline that it's yeah. it's OK now. Now that Nakamura's in the rearview mirror, my spinal column's good. Got what MJF um, got probably. He's fine. Jay stops a buckle bomb on the floor. DDTs and we go through a, a second commercial. There were some intermittent chance of CM Punk, but nothing overwhelming. I feel no. like they're and even if they are, like it, it plays into Rollins' storyline. He's oh, Rollins I'm saying, I'm stating. I think they're understated. I think they oh. they are hoping for more of the punk stuff, especially last week. You could tell with right. like Rollins like encouraging it. Like it's they're not overwhelming, and I I think now's the time they want them to be overwhelming. Sure. Well, I think when prompted, they come out like when Drew made that reference on at the beginning. Jay hits a hip attack as Cole notes uh, Umaga, and then he hits a he gets hit by a sling blade and frog splash, and now we're just into near fall city. Jay stops a pedigree, each lands super kicks, and then Rollins goes down from a second one. Uso splash connects, Rollins kicks out. Then he hits the superplex falcon arrow combo, hits the pedigree, Jay kicks out. Jay avoids a stomp, and then he spears Rollins. Rollins kicks out. Then another spear gets stopped with a kick to the face, buckle bomb, but as Jay takes the buckle bomb, he rebounds with another spear, lands the Uso splash, and again, Rollins kicks out. And as Jay lands a super kick, he goes for a spear, and he spears himself into a pedigree, which I was really glad was not the finish because th this was not the smoothest. It, it, fine idea, tough execution of the spear into a seamless pedigree. But uh, he finished him with the stomp, and Seth wins in 23 minutes and 10 seconds. Wade Barrett suggests that they break the title in two and give 50% of it to Jay for his performance. Yes, we need a third world title. That's that's the, or however many we count with. Well, Roman we did now. that with the Divas Championship once. I that's think. right. They literally did. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, there you go. That was uh, the end. They, they shook hands. You got a clean finish, which I did not think we were getting. Uh, mm -hmm. Instead, they saved Drew for after the match where he popped up from around the barricade. Claymore Jay then caught Seth and belly to belly to him on the floor. And then he put Jay through the desk and the final line from my favorite commentator. Drew McIntyre is a bad dude with issues. <laughs> I mean, is he not? I hope that's his new nickname. Yeah. A bad dude with issues. <laughs> um, You know, Jay's story on raw isn't necessarily going for the championship. It's to basically um not get beaten up by drew mcintyre i feel you know it's to get accepted by the locker room it's to make amends for the crimes of of, of his past and he's already kind of passed all that um and now he just if has this to has been sure. such a thorn in his side and he saw how easy he got forgiven by randy yeah at what point would you be like jay it's like okay 
I'm just going to apologize to this guy. Like maybe, maybe this does not have to be so difficult. <laughs> That's true. This You're is right. the crux of Drew's problem. Is like you never apologized. I just apologize at this point. This is getting a little uh, inconvenient. <laughs> It's probably too late now, don't you think? You know, he's he's just. I mean, it's the entire I've been sort thinking, of like last week is like, man, the, the 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 viper, this guy who calls himself a snake. I mean, he was pretty chill about this whole screwing them thing. Yeah. He apologized at, at the first chance he had, which Jay did not. So it, really, it's all on Jay. Um, but again, Drew McIntyre is being set up as like the 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 center of WWE Raw right now. For whatever reason, Judgment Day, half of Judgment Day seem to you know take the show off, and usually they're the focal point of the show. Now that War Games is done, we're moving on to Drew McIntyre, and he's got programs going on. He he was responsible for taking out Sami Zayn tonight. He's got a long term program with uh, a Jay, another one with um uh, uh, Seth Rollins potentially, and another potential one with CM Punk that they might be you know building at, at this point too. So. Um, yeah, if, if you're holding off on Rollins and Punk until Mania, I, th mm -hmm. I think Drew is a great option for yeah. for January. Like I, totally. I'm not crazy about putting Punk in the Rumble if he's not winning it, and and he doesn't need to be winning it if if he's facing Rollins, and you could put him in the Chamber or or go that direction. Sure, yeah, a lot of options. There's a yeah. lot of options to get where where you're going. Like mm -hmm. they they've got kind of a, a an abundance of interesting like players in the mix, especially on the Raw side. Yeah. I thought, you know, for a show that was missing CM Punk, missing Randy Orton, missing Finn Balor, missing Rhea Ripley, I found the show like over exceeded my expectations. I think they did some really good storytelling, especially with Drew um, and especially with the a really good Nakamura Cody promo that I think, you know, immediately makes that feud feel a lot hotter. Um, strong DIY match, you know, tonight as well. I, I'd say you got three pretty pretty strong tv matches tonight like you got two 20 plus minute matches with drew and sammy the main event and then 15 minutes with imperium and diy um the promo segments you mentioned like i thought this was a pretty pretty strong episode of raw overall especially you're right given the fact that i'm sure there were a lot of people tuning in tonight that would have just assumed that cm punk would be on the show mm -hmm. and it's not like you had this audience that was turning on things when they realized like, I was curious after Pierce did that segment announcing him for next week if the crowd was going to be negative, but that did not take the air out of the sales for the main event. Yeah, yeah. Albany maybe should be upgraded to an A plus town. Um, let's let's not B plus B plus. Here. Okay. Yeah. Well, that that was a uh, that was raw three hours. That um overall a good a good episode mm -hmm. this week. Uh, setting us up for Cleveland next week. We will now get your thoughts on the show. Maybe, maybe we are just out to lunch. Maybe everyone is. Uh, are people going to call us shills? Are we under WWE. WWE's payroll now? Because we like Guys, the show. Yeah, you. Yeah. Um, the comments I get about AEW, then then, then they check the WWE. It's amazing how this all, all works. Forum.postarsing.com. Oops, sorry. Forum.postarsing.com. You want me to to start things off? Sure. Why don't you go? All right. Let's go to Benjamin, who says. It's like Raw and Dynamite swapped creative direction. Finding Dynamite's Devil Who Cares storyline is really flat, while Raw opened with a great promo and compelling ongoing logic and continuity from Drew McIntyre. Like someone did a 13 going on 30 to their booking. It's really disheartening to see Nia Jax go over Shayna Baszler. I mean, it's a direction of going. Listen, I, I will say we didn't have a chance to talk about it. I thought Collision was very strong on Saturday night. It had the Brian Danielson, Eddie Kingston match. Like, dude, the, the Continental Classic matches have been very strong uh, yeah. so far. But I thought that was a really entertaining edition of Collision. Best match of the tournament so far? In your opinion? Danielson and Kingston, I would probably put it uh, at that level. You got that to solid. me was absolutely a G1 level. Like, I would, I would say main event you know, for a G1 show. Um, I was not expecting that level of physicality for a guy who just came back from Orbital. Do, do you like the eye patch? I thought we were going to um, get like face mask from Danielson, but instead he's going with the the eye cover. It's it's something else. Like, I don't know how that man's able to wrestle, um, much less wrestle like that with that sort of eye patch. But I mean, it, it's, it's cool. It's cool. All right, next one up, we're going to go to Chris. Oh, no, sorry. Manny from Pacoima. Solid episode of Raw that flew by fast. Rollins and Jay had a good match that was hyped up by a fantastic video package for Jay Uso. The Creeds continue to show the world just how talented they are, and Julius's overhead suplex train is always a sight to see. With the number one contenders to the women's tag titles being pinned tonight, can we expect a triple threat tag? Um, um, well, Naya, well, uh, Tegan and Natalia lost their match to the champions last week. So, right. Um, so, who are the other contenders? Um, Eventually, well, it'll be not. Who are the other teams? Period. It's 
Chance and Carter. So naturally, they they seem to be um, putting you in that direction tonight. Sure. Yeah. Octagon Jr. is the new AAA Latin American champion, ending the reign of the two-time main eventer QT Marshall. And after a 183-day reign, RS and Commander lost their tag titles in their first and only defense. That is our Lucha update from Manny from Pacoima. Thank you. Uh, Chris Kent, with an off topic for a bit, could a prelim fight on a fight night card be in contention for fight of the year? Holy crap. Bellato versus Potieria was insane. Yeah. Yes, this was on the undercard of Saturday's card, which was a crazy uh, card in Austin, Texas. Um, yeah, this fight was nuts. Like there were knockdowns both ways and uh, Bellato made the comeback at the end and finished. But this was just one that if you were watching it live, um, you would have just been um, just in awe of what these guys were doing. Um, they got fight of the night, obviously, uh, on the show, but they, they gave out a ton of performance of the night bonuses. Like there were a ton of finishes on this card. One absolutely egregious late stoppage uh, by uh, with Jalen Turner beating uh, Bobby Green. But um, overall, um, a very strong card on Saturday. All right. But the answer to your question is yes, of course, uh, a prelim can win fight of the night or fight of the year even. Next up is Muggin, a strong episode with a great emphasis on in-ring action. The main event was damn good, a damn good TV match. I was expecting a run-in. I was glad it was saved till after the bell with true McIntyre asserting his will. The two out of three falls match was dope, and I'm pleased with the smaller doses approach to Judgment Day with Damian Priest throwing his weight around. I bet the tug of war will intensify for the rest of the month. I'm off to watch the GTA 6 trailer again. Mm -hmm. so, did, you, did you see it? I have not. Hasn't this been like years in the making? It's been like 10 years since wow. the last one came out. Were so. you a GTA player? Not really. I wasn't much of a video game player at all, but, at all, but like I, I picked up like, I don't know, the PS3 at, when it was like seven years old and GTA was, yeah, one of the games that you buy, of course. Yeah, I'm um, I'm curious. I've kind of, uh, I've, I've heard about the hype of this game. I don't even I play. Don't play I don't even play. I just like roam around. You know, I just like drive and and I just, I just go, go out places. For, a, for a stroll, go buy your groceries. It's incredibly relaxing. Like, you know, you can like, I don't know, like jump into a plane. If you see a plane, um, uh, just, uh, I don't know, run into the ocean and just like do drive a car in the ocean. You know, is this on like all systems? I know I, all, all the new current gen systems. I, I would think, I don't know. What do you have? I have nothing. I, I would have to get invest. What do you yeah. have? What can I come over and play? I, I got nothing right now. I don't have, I got a child. That's, that's the only, and oh. he's not playing. I don't think uh, it's compatible with him yet. I, I would say GTA, pro probably not for, for, a, for a young child, but uh, right. one day. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for the feedback. Um, just to note that uh, coming up this week, up next, we'll be live on Tuesday night with Braden Harrington and Davey Portman. They also did an interview with Hollywood Haley J. Uh, that you can go catch poisonrana.ca as they talk about her uh, her fame through the wrestlers on Netflix and on women of wrestling, which Braden actually got to speak about someone about wow, women of wrestling. I wonder how happy. how often Hollywood Haley J has been asked about wow, women of wrestling. Women, of I wrestling. bet it's more than we think. The, when you see these numbers, like these people exist out there. Where are they? They're not hmm. on wrestling sites. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I don't hear, I don't hear a peep about this show. Uh, Wednesday night, uh, I will be back with Andrew Thompson as uh, Way is on a much-deserved vacation. Him and I will be reviewing the show from Montreal featuring Adam Copeland and Christian Cage. Their second match, their second singles match in 21 years. Oh, really? The last one was all the way Outside back? Outside of that whole 2001 feud they had, yeah, they like that was pretty much it. That was all their singles matches. They did a one-off in 2010, and that was it. They spent a good amount of time um, apart from each other in different companies on different apart. shows. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's wow. been a good buildup, and you know, hopefully, it hopefully it uh, delivers on Wednesday. And tomorrow, we find out who the best wrestler in Canada is. That's right, Ethan Page and Kenny Omega. This will be on the Collision tapings Tuesday to air on Saturday. And for those in Canada, TSN Two is airing Rampage and Collision this week uh, because they're in Canada. For whatever reason, that's when they decide to put them on TV when there's a Canadian show. Interesting. Okay. But not uh, the other weeks. Kate from Montreal will be will be there. So I look forward to hearing her uh, live attendance thoughts uh, this Sunday on Collision Course. Special time, Sunday. Yes. For Cafe members this week, you've got Rewind to SmackDown, Collision Course, and the World Tag League Finals uh, coming up uh, Friday 
and Sunday uh, this coming weekend. So and check out everybody that. show some love to John's uh, excellent summation of everything going on with Tammy Sitch with the what happened to Tammy Sitch audio documentary that is currently out for free right now for everybody listening to this feed or watching at youtube.com slash post wrestling. Yes, we uh, we want to put it out for for everybody uh, to check out. So that is available now, both uh, on the podcast feed and at youtube.com slash post wrestling. Uh, all we ask in exchange, hit that subscribe button. OK, Way's going on vacation. Let's give him a big send off. Hit that subscribe button. Let's get those numbers up. Let's double them by the time Way gets back. And uh, Way will be back next Monday. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, have a wonderful week, Way. Uh, you more than deserve, uh, you deserve a year of vacation, but uh, you're only taking a week off. Uh, please don't watch any wrestling and um, ha- have, a, have a couple of those drinks with, with Oscar. Have some shots, do whatever is necessary to get I'll your mind. See, I'll off. see what he wants to have. Yeah. 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 You know, it's probably straight orange juice. I mean, <laughs> let's not get crazy. All right. Okay. It's a, thank you, John. And uh, thank you in advance because, like, anytime one of us takes any time off, it's, it's a little bit of hell for the other person. So, uh, you know, I I know you'll be more than fine. So, but thank you in advance. Well, uh, look forward to it. Uh, Andrew Thompson with me on Wednesday. Neil Flanagan with me on Friday night for wow. Rewind to SmackDown. We're going to open up the phone lines with Neil. Uh, I look forward to uh, doing a show with uh, with both Andrew and Neil this week. So everything can be found. Postwrestling.com, postwrestlingcafe.com, and that will wrap up Rewind to Raw.